Hi, Tina. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit and join us in on this webinar today. So genealogy is not just my hobby. It is my passion. It is what I love to do. Um, it is one of my favorite things. And I think Louise, who has worked with me for a number of years, can tell you that you know, I can turn any conversation from baseball to music back to genealogy in one way or another. This is true. <laughs> so I truly love what I do. And hopefully, um, you will, if you don't already love it, you will learn to appreciate it um, as you start to have more and more patrons coming in and asking you questions. So throughout the course of the webinar, I'm going to, Louise will be posting some poll questions to kind of get a feel for your level of expertise, what you're interested in, the types of things that you offer through your library. Um, genealogy has gone mainstream over the last several years. Um, it's gone from music into movies. Um, when they start making fun of genealogists and genealogy on shows like Jimmy Kimmel and you know Jimmy Fallon, you know that it's gone mainstream. Um, genealogy used to just be sung about by country stars like you know Loretta Lynn with Family Tree or the infamous I'm My Own Grandpa. But um, even musicians like Train are starting to put genealogy and genealogy subjects into their music now. So it truly has gone mainstream. And you're not going to see a decrease in the number of people who are coming to you and who are asking questions about their ancestry. It's just going to be something that's going to continue. So one of the first poll questions that we have um, is your level of expertise. So you should be seeing from Louise on the sidebar a poll that will pop up that asks what your level of expertise is from I'm an expert, I've been doing this for a generation, to I've never done any genealogy, nor have I helped a patron. So Louise is going to be monitoring that. So please take the time to kind of let us know where you are along that spectrum. All right, we'll um, keep it open for a few more seconds. I've got about half the people have voted. All right, I'm going to do five more seconds. All right, thanks everyone. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show you the results. Um, it looks like about 14% of you um, say you're an expert. Um, you've traced your family back to Charlemagne. <laughs> Um, most of you, 66%, are dabblers. You have found a few things but haven't had much time. And 21% of you are newbies, and um, this, you've not done any research on your own ancestry. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully what each of you, from expert down to newbie, will find something today that you might not have thought of using before, or it's going to give you um, an idea of where to look for something um, that you wouldn't have normally chosen. I find that the longer you do this, no matter what your profession is, whether you're a business librarian or a genealogy librarian or whatever your category might be, that we kind of get into a rut. And we go to the same resources over and over again. And webinars and lectures and opportunities to mingle with other people will bring in some fresh ideas and some new sites you might not have thought of or using certain sites in ways that you hadn't thought of using before. So hopefully you'll each walk away with something. Um, so genealogy, the textbook book term, is the study or investigation of ancestry and family histories. You know, to a genealogist, what that means is it's the never-ending pursuit of every single piece of information that you can find on every ancestor from now until the time you die. So who are genealogists? What are they seeking? You know, where can you find the answers? You know, they're looking for everything. It doesn't matter how small the piece of information is. Um, whatever you can provide them, from the mundane newspaper article about little Johnny falling off a horse to the vital record that they've been seeking for 15 years. Um, we each have things in our library that we might not necessarily consider to be genealogy related, per se. You know, we have reference books. We have um, surname books. We have things like um, um, professions, you know, guidebooks to professions. and. You know, even dictionaries and encyclopedias are going to give explanations of terms that you might find in a historical record. We have maps, we have phone books and city directories, we have newspapers. All of these are resources that you can use within your collection to help that person when they come to the desk for the first time or for the 100th time. So it is 
imperative. It's the most important thing that you can do as a librarian is to know what you have within your collection. So when somebody comes to you, you know, you're going to be able to provide that information, whether it's somebody looking for ancestors who lived in your area or whether or not it's one of your patrons who's looking for information on somebody in Massachusetts or in Bavaria. You're going to be able to kind of use that knowledge base to help them, whether it's locally or internationally. So if you haven't assessed your collection, that's the number one thing that you can do. Creating finding aids sounds more complicated than it is. It's really just putting together a list of reference sources that you have. You know, if you have phone books that go from, you know, 1956 to 1996, make a list of it. So when somebody comes in and they're looking for 1923, you can say, oh, I don't have that. Here's where we begin. Do you have a local historical society or genealogical society in your era, area that you can rely on for information? There are some outstanding genealogical collections that are in local libraries. Um, the Vespasian Warner Library in Clinton has the DeWitt County Genealogical Society collection, and it is probably the best one I have ever seen. So well done, Vespasian Warner. Um, Princeton has an outstanding collection. Um, the Carbondale Library has a good genealogical collection. So we're not talking big towns and big cities. There are small towns throughout Illinois who have outstanding resources where they've worked with their local genealogical society to put things together. The Oswego Public Library, where I live, has the Fox Valley Genealogical Society collection. Cole City Public Library has the Will Grundy County Genealogical Society collection in it. So if you have the opportunity to work with your local society, by all means do it. Because typically, a library has better access hours. You know, you're open more days of the week than the local historical society is. So a lot of times you can kind of be that gateway to turning people onto the society by being able to say, well, we have this, but they have X, Y, Z. And if you don't own it and your local society doesn't own it, are there libra interlibrary loan libraries to where you can get that information from as well? So most of us have probably used interlibrary loan at one time or another. Um, but a lot of us don't think of using interlibrary loan for geneal genealogy titles. And that absolutely can be done as long as you know the, the steps that are involved. So through WorldCat, you can get a great list of rare, um, not often used, not often available genealogical titles. The problem with using WorldCat is that a lot of those libraries won't send. So you have to figure out over time who's going to lend and who's not going to lend. Um, so if a genealogical book is held at a college or university library, typically you can get that to circulate because they're a reference library, they're a circulating collection, they're not a historical society or a genealogy library that's going to have that in-house only. Um, if it is only owned at a genealogical society library or at a genealogy library like the Newberry Library, often they're happy to fax or email the pages to you as long as they don't exceed a certain number of pages. So like in Urbana, they'll send up to 20 pages as long as you tell them exactly what it is you're looking for. So it's a way to use the system to your advantage and to your patron's advantage um, when you just can't possibly find it online or you just can't possibly have it in your library as well. So what the patrons see when they go to WorldCat is they see the opportunity to look for books, DVDs, CDs, articles. Um, I did an example for the history of the Courtright family. I have a patron at my library who's been trying to get a hold of this book for ages. It's available through Heritage Quest, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but she can't download the whole book. And what she really wants is to just download the whole book. So we went into WorldCat. We did a search on the title. We've used WorldCat before, so you know it's going to give you a list of references to where what titles reference the court, Courtright family and where they're accessible. So at the bottom, the early history of the Courtright family, um, which was published in 1907, it's outside of copyright. So what you'll see on this next slide is you see the libraries who own it, University of Chicago Library, Newberry Library, Allen County Public Library, but at the bottom of that screen, number six, you see Hathi Trust Digital Library. I'm going to come back to Hathi Trust um, in a couple of minutes, but I wanted you to see that what you're seeing on this collection aren't just bricks and mortar libraries. The Hathi Trust is a digital library that you have access to as well. So when you're using WorldCat, you'll see things like that that'll pop up. If you look just above it, Indiana State Library, book not held, one other format. It means that they've got it most likely on microfilm. So 
what genealogical libraries are you going to see when you're using WorldCat? Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library here in Illinois, Allen County Public Library in Indiana, the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah, Cincinnati Hamilton County Library has an outstanding collection, um, but their genealogical materials do not circulate. Neither does the Newberry Library in Chicago, Mid-Continent Public Library in Independence, Missouri. Library of Congress will pop up on your list from time to time as well, but their genealogy collection is non-circulating as well. So if you find some place like University of Michigan, University of Chicago, UIC, any college or university library is more likely to lend a genealogical title if you see it. But if these are the only libraries that own it, you know that you can usually contact them and they can send you copies by fax or by email as well. So I mentioned Hathi Trust. So there are lots of collections that are popping up online to where you can find digital materials. You don't always have to just go to Google Books like we used to five or ten years ago. Um, I don't know how many of you have used the Digital Public Library. Um, I'm going to show you a couple screenshots of that in a minute. But you also have Family Search um, and Internet Archives, which is my personal favorite, and I'm going to walk you through that in a little bit. So I mentioned the Courtright family. So if I put in in DPLA, if I put in the Courtright family, you see it shows me three different books. Um, it shows me the ancestors and descendants of Reuben Courtright, the Courtright family descendants, and history of Van Courtricks and Courtrights. What's interesting about DPLA is when you go to a title, sometimes it takes you to a completely different collection like Hathi Trust. And you see off to the left-hand side that it tells me that all three of these objects come from the Hathi Trust. So while DPLA is great because it has a lot of original content in there, you're going to see a lot of overlap as you're using these different collections. So something that might be available in Google Books, but you can't download it, might show up in Hathi Trust. So unless you're one of the Hathi Trust members, which are UIC and University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, you can't download it there either. So then you have to get a lot more creative to where else can I find this? Can I find it in... Um, Internet Archives, can I find it in Family Search? How else can I get a hold of some of these titles? So DPLA has some great things in it. Um, just recently, the Illinois Digital Archive collection um, signed a contract to be uploaded into DPLA. So within the next six months, you're going to see the Illinois materials start to populate into the DPLA databases as well. So there's some really cool things, and DPLA is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, so it's a reference source that you're going to want to come back to over and over again, and not just for genealogical materials. It, it has a lot of things in it that you can use um, to your advantage, plus you can keep track of particular titles by putting together your own bookshelf. So when somebody comes to you and says, I'm looking for things on your community, you can have a bookshelf already set aside in DPLA where you can point your patrons. Pardon me for my technical difficulties here. Um, Internet Archives is another one of my favorite things, too. And I'm going to talk about that a little later on when I start showing you specific websites. Um, but I did have, I believe, another poll question um, for all of you. So before I go any further, Louise is going to pop up another poll question for you. Does your library have a dedicated genealogy or local history staff member or volunteer? And it's just yes or no. And I see people are voting, so I'll give it a few more seconds. All right. You all were very quick on your clicks, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share that with you so you can see. And it says that 41% of you attending today that, yes, you do have a dedicated uh, genealogy or local history staff member or volunteer. And 59% of you do not. So thanks. Thank you. For those of you who do not, or even those of you who do, um, there's always training opportunities. So you can brush up on your skills. You can take courses based on specific interests that you have. or um, you might not know a lot about African American genealogy and you want to learn more. There are all kinds of tutorials and free lessons and courses that are out there and available to you. 
Um, Ancestry has a couple of collections. Family Search has a couple of collections. Those are kind of the two biggest heavy hitters in the genealogical world. So for those of you who have been doing this or dabbled a little, then you're familiar with those two um, corporations. Um, for those of you who are just starting and might not know um, what's available and what's out there, um, there's actually Ancestry.com, which is the commercials that you see on TV with the people who talk about the little leaves that help you trace your family tree. Ancestry.com is more for the individual user. What we see in the library world is what's called Ancestry Library Edition, and it's actually owned by a completely different company. It's been sold over the years. It was owned by Gale, and now it's owned by ProQuest, um, but it's not the same as the .com. It's about 85% the same. The things that we don't get are the city directory collections, the newspapers, um, and the obituaries. What we do see is we do see the family trees. So if somebody's searching for their ancestry, they'll see the trees out there that are made public. Um, but you cannot add to those trees, and you cannot um, send those people a message. That's specifically to the .com. And it makes sense, because Ancestry.com is a for-profit corporation. And so if you can do genealogy research from your pajamas at 3 AM through your library subscription, they're not making any money. Um, not that I personally do that very often, uh, but it does happen from time to time. So Family Tree or Family Search um, actually is, is a free genealogy website, and I'll talk about it a little, little, little later on. It's run by the Mormons, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and their belief is that if genealogy is made accessible to the public for free, um, as people convert to Mormonism, then you know they have the ability to bring their family in, their ancestors in, um, to the Mormon faith as well. So they make this available for people for free so that they can have access to, um, to these collections. So they have a lot of original images in there. They've got original vital records, military records, church records, you name it, they have it accessible. But they also offer an extensive list of training. So I left the link in your handout, and you'll get it when Louise sends it out. But every month, they put out a list of what their online courses are that are going to be coming up throughout the, that particular month. But they also offer a wiki. And in that wiki, they've got whatever topic you can think of um, they've got available to you, whether you're doing New England research or Irish research or California Gold Rush research. They're going to have information available to you, either in forms, um, or in actual lectures that you can follow along. Ancestry.com has that as well, so does the library edition. They offer what's called Ancestry Learning Center. And then if any of you have teachers in your family or you have students who are in K through 12, um, their individual teachers can contact Ancestry to get what is called Ancestry University. And that is free to all K through 12 students and teachers. You just need to contact them for a username and password, and then you have access to their tutorials and to some of their very basic genealogical materials online. So not just genealogy librarians and not just um, genealogists, but they're trying to bring teachers and students into the fold as well. So pass that along to anybody you know who happens to be a teacher or a student between uh, K through 12. The Illinois State Genealogical Society, to which I'm a member, also offers free webinars that you have access to. Um, some cool things about um, what they have to offer is you get access. I don't know if you can see that here. If you're a member, you have access to past webinars. But if you, do not ha if you are not a member, you have access to what's upcoming. And you can register for any of the courses that they offer. And they always have a list with a description of the speaker and the presentation. And you can register for any of these as well. You'll see in April they have Lisa Alzo. I'm going to mention her a little later on. Um, she's actually going to be here um, on the 12th. She's going to be speaking at the DuPage Genealogical Society Conference. Um, and she just published a book on um, Eastern European, Polish, Czech, and Slovak ancestors. Um, so they really do have top-notch speakers who are giving webinars um, as well. Many Roads is, he's an aggregator. And what his site has done is he has gone out and trolled the internet, not in a negative way, to find information for free courses and free webinars. And on his site, he has links to dozens of different free courses. Um, some of them are older that have been archived, that are accessible to you to use at any point. 
And in your handouts off to the side on your screen, um, there's a reference sheet that's eight pages. All of the web links are in that handout. You don't need to worry about trying to copy them down. Um, so when I talk about reference resources and I talk about websites, you won't see the web addresses in the PowerPoint presentation because they are all on that handout and then some. You have eight pages worth of free genealogical websites to use in that handout when you download it. So for Ancestry, whether you're using the .com or the library edition, um, on the header you're going to see a little link that says Learning Center. And most of us have a tendency to skip this because we either know what we're looking for or we really just go to search. That's where we want to go. Um, so you go to search and you start looking. Um, but if you click on that Learning Center tab, what it brings up are lists of topics and lists of different handouts and presentations that they have accessible to you. So you have access to charts and forms. You can download worksheets. You can download blank census forms. You can download family group sheets, all kinds of different um, materials for you to use that you can give out to your patrons, that you can use if you teach your own genealogical classes. Um, but down at the bottom, they also have their research guides and their programs and their classes that you can sit in on as well. The downside to the changes Ancestry made last year was you used to have access to Ancestry Academy where you could watch videos on hundreds of different topics. But now Ancestry Academy is no longer free. Um, the fee is $100 per year or $12 per month. Um, so while we used to have access to Ancestry Academy, sadly now we just have to rely on what they offer in the Learning Center. I don't know if you'll have the opportunity to add this into the um, chat box that Louise has off to the side there, but how many of you follow genealogical blogs or RSS feeds? Do I have that as one of my poll questions? Okay, I thought about it, but I didn't want to inundate all of you with questions. Um, but I'm curious to know if any of you do subscribe to a genealogical blog or an RSS SS feed like Dick Eastman or Dear Myrtle. I love Mert. Um, Mert has um, Mondays with Mert where she used to have Google Hangouts where you can go and listen to a topic for an hour, uh, but now she offers them through her own website so you don't have to have a Google subscription any longer. Um, but there are some out standing ones out there. National Genealogical Society has a blog post every single day. Um, Genealogy Today posts every Sunday night and they kind of give you an aggregate of all of the genealogy topics and articles that have been posted throughout the week. Um, Diane Haddad from Family Tree Magazine has Genealogy Insider that she puts out once a month. Um, so it depends on your level of interest. You can sign up for a daily like Dick Eastman or you can sign up for a monthly um, like Diane Haddad through Genealogy Insider. But I highly recommend that you sign up for at least one because even if that daily topic is not something that's pertinent to you or your research or your patron's research, it might spark something in your head where you say, oh, that reminds me, I wonder if that would be available in our area. Or you file that knowledge away. Um, National Genealogical Society often posts web links to collections that have just gone online. So I bookmark them. I have thousands of bookmarks on my computer because every day there'll be a new one and I'll bookmark it in case somebody comes to me and says, what do you have on West Virginia? And then I have a roster of, of genealogical sites that I can pass along. And those are all things that I get from the genealogy blogs that I subscribe to. Um, most people who answered, thank you for commenting, most people have not followed any genealogy blogs. So, but they're I, interested. I highly recommend it. Like I said, it depends on your level of interest. Dick Eastman is wonderful, but he's daily. National Genealogical Society is, is awesome. They're incredible, but they're also daily. So it just depends on your, on your level of interest. If you just want to wet your, wet your, stick your toe in the water and see how it goes, Genealogy Today might be a good one because it's just once a week on Sundays. Um, and it kind of gives you a list of what's been going on. So it kind of does that work of searching the web for you. And these are listed in that handout that I gave you with the web links directly to the site. There are lots of national societies, and actually several of those are in Illinois or in Chicago. So the Polish Genealogical Society of America is based here in Chicago. Um, Afrogen uh, I never say it right, and I apologize. Afrogenius 
um, is another great site. They're based out of Atlanta for African American research. We do get questions on that fairly often, and it's a great resource to point people, people to. Federation of Genealogical Societies does accept libraries as members, so you would get their quarterly, you would have access to their databases. Um, but then more specific things, Daughters of the American Revolution has some outstanding databases, Jewish Genealogical Society, um, and then again, National Genealogical Society, which I had just mentioned. This is just a small sam sampling of the number of national societies that exist. They exist for ethnicities, they exist for occupations, um, railroad family members, family members who were Masons, all kinds of different societies are out there and accessible to you to use as a resource. My next poll question, have you participated in other online genealogy webinars or courses? Oh, I was thinking the... Or what databases? The databases, yes. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so my question to all of you is, do you have genealogical websites that you offer, already offer through your library's homepage? Do you have Ancestry? Do you have Heritage Quest? Um, so Louise is going to put together a quick poll so we get a feel for what you're already offering. And I apologize, I put the poll in to only select one rather than multiple. So um, maybe check the one that's your favorite. <laughs> Sorry about that. Or that gets the most use, maybe. Yeah, or gets the most use. And if you want to um, add any others, you can go ahead and type those into your chat box in the questions. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and show you the results. Um, so uh, Ancestry Library Edition was by far the largest. 69% um, uh, of you marked that. 28% uh, of you marked Heritage Quest. Uh, nobody marked Fold 3 or World Vital Records. And 3% of you offered Genealogy Bank or another historical newspaper database. Um, and some of the comments that are coming in is that you also have Ancestry or Heritage Quest um, as well. So, um, or some of you have both Ancestry and Heritage Quest. So, thank you. The Ancestry Library Edition is owned by ProQuest, which owns Heritage Quest. So, for those of us who have been doing this for a while, last April when they made the switch to the new platform for Heritage Quest, it was extremely painful. Because in Heritage Quest, genealogists loved it because you could dig deeper. You could do a more granular search by occupation or by age range or by um, birth location. We lost a lot of that when Heritage Quest um, took on the Ancestry Slider platform. So I know for me it was particularly painful um, because I lost the ability to do that granular search by, you know, men named John between the ages of 50 and 59, you know, who lived in Chicago but were born in Albany. I lost the ability to do that. So while Heritage Quest is great because we can use it from home and your patrons can be on it at 4 a.m. if they want, the downside to the fact that they're owned by the same company is the fact that they brought in that Ancestry Slider platform, which is great for beginners, but for advanced genealogists and for professionals, you know, it was basically a slap in the face to those of us who wanted to be able to use Heritage Quest to do local history research where I wanted to search by occupation or street name versus surname. So it, it's been a hard adjustment. And some of us have actually turned to using some of these other resources that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but the great side to it is the fact that you don't have to be in the library in order to access Heritage Quest. But it makes sense that Ancestry and Heritage Quest are the two biggest library products out there. Um, so for those of you who have another newspaper database, whether it's historical newspapers online, genealogybanknewspapers.com, whatever it happens to be, that's outstanding that you have the ability to make those available to your patrons. So some other useful genealogy tools before I go into some actual specific websites. Um, there are things out there to help you figure out birthday calculators. Um, so if you're like me and you spend more time in cemeteries when you're on vacation than you know anywhere else, um, you're looking at a headstone and it says they died at the age of 72, to, 72 years, 3 months, and 5 days. There are birth date calculators out there to help you figure out exactly what that means. Um, the Hebrew date calculator, again, it's the same thing, only it does it based on the Hebrew calendar. Um, 
Heritage Quest, for those libraries that have it, offers an outstanding map collection that's available to you. But if you don't have Heritage Quest, those same maps are available to you through historical county lines, which are available in the handout that I gave you. And then Cindy's list and link pendant, uh, Linkpendium are what are called aggregators, which means that they go out and they scour the web to look for websites based on the genealogy topic that you're searching. And then you can use them to pinpoint your research to a specific location. Cindy's list is great. I don't know how many of you have used it, but I get lost pretty regularly when I use it because I'll wind up seven clicks in and have absolutely no idea how I got there. Um, Linkpendium is my go-to. Actually, I will go to that before I go to any other site first. And the reason why I love Linkpendium is because it takes our small library collections, it takes our small genealogical society collections, and it makes them accessible online to where they normally get lost in the fray. So, for example, if I was looking for Perry County, Illinois, I could go to Linkpendium, choose Illinois, choose Perry County, and it's going to give me a listing of all of the websites that exist by category. So, bibliographies, cemeteries, vital records, military records, newspapers, libraries, archives, and it's going to give me links to all of the different places where that information exists in Perry County. I use that as my example because the Perry County Historical Society has an outstanding website with all kinds of um, databases and indexes available for people who are doing research downstate. But Linkpendium makes that easy for me to find. These little homegrown societies get lost a lot of times when you're doing Google searches, which I'll talk about in a minute. But sites like Cindy's List and Linkpendium really do an outstanding job of making them accessible to you in an easy format. I mentioned books earlier and I talked about Internet Archives. You know, every couple of years I geek out, like hardcore geek out on a new genealogical site that's come out that I just find outstanding. So for a couple of years I had a torrid love affair with Find a Grave and that kind of has simmered down and Internet Archives is, is the new love of my life at the moment. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of Internet Archives, it was literally founded by two hippies in California who worked for Berkeley. And when I say hippies, they have the entire Grateful Dead bootleg collection on their website. So if any of you are Grateful Dead fans, they've got practically every concert that they've done in every city in America for 50 years. So check it out, because I'm sure somebody probably put the Chicago concerts last year up already. But what Internet Archives did was they got sick and tired of having to pay to have access to books that were out of copyright. So they started digitizing books that were pre-1923. And they made those full text available, and they scanned them in color. So they are gorgeous. So you know when you're looking at old microfilm or old books in Heritage Quest and you lose the images because they scan them in black and white and you just get a blank page, they scan everything in color and they are gorgeous, just gorgeous. So they have city directories, they have county histories, they have family histories, they have government records, they have the entire U.S. Census on microfilm up to 1940 available. You can download a reel at a time and go through it like you were sitting in front of a microfilm reader. They have um, the Archives of Canada Homestead Collection. So if you had homesteaders in Canada that were in Winnipeg or were in Alberta, you can download the homestead application files and make available to you. So what was this small group of people became major libraries and universities and archives that wanted to be part of it because it was so successful. So I went to Scotland in September of 2014, and before I went, I was able to find online the postal directories from the 18th century for Edinburgh and for Finnick and Kilmarnock, which were the cities, Georgian, which is where I was going, because the National Library of Scotland has put their collection up on Internet Archives. So I don't have to try to figure out where something exists. I can go to Internet Archives first and see if somebody has it, and then if they don't have it, then I can start doing a little bit more digging. You can sign up for a free account. You can upload your own collections as a library or as an individual. You can upload your own collections and make them available. Or you can pull collections together and bookmark certain topics so that you have access to them later when you need them. I absolutely love their site. So when you go to Internet Archives, the web link is archive, there's no S, archive.org, and that's in your handout. Um, but what you can do is I can just do a generic search on genealogy. And what it does is it tells me there are over 1,200 individual collections that are accessible that have genealogy as the main topic. So along the right-hand side, not only does it show me the collections by, by type, I can look for 
microfilm, I can look for books, I can look for videos, but it also tells me the collections and their sizes as well. So I can see that the Allen County Public Library has a very large genealogy collection. I can click on that under the collections list and it'll show me the titles. And at the, at the bottom, underneath the title, it tells you how many people have viewed it, how many times it's been downloaded, and the format types as well. So if I clicked on a particular title, it would ask me, how do you want it? Do you want it as a PDF? Do you want it as an EPUB? Do you want it as a Kindle book? How do you want to download this? And it really is an absolutely outstanding um, resource, regardless of the topic. It doesn't have to be genealogy. It can be metaphysics. It can be veterinary science. It doesn't matter. You can also browse the book right there on their website. So for example, if I don't want the hassle of downloading the PDF, I can just do a search of the book itself right online. So in this case, I was looking at an architectural book and I was looking for information on Lewis Sullivan. So when I put in Sullivan as the topic, all of those little marks at the bottom start to pop up to show me all of the pages where Sullivan is listed in the text. So it's a really fantastic resource that's available to you. Since I have a little bit of time, I was worried I was going to run out of time, I'm going to show you a live example of how Internet Archive works. So the Wayback Machine, ignore this box up here, unless you want to look for old websites and videos. So the Wayback Machine is really designed to show you um, broadcasts from 1997 or websites from 2003. But if you're looking for actual text, you're looking for um, resources, you want to use this box down here at the bottom. So I told you I was looking for court rights earlier. That one that was in Hathi Trust that I could not get my hands on because it wasn't available to be downloaded, I can find within here. And if I want to search it, I can do the screenshot that we had just seen before. Or I can go up into the corner, I, I can do my search, and I can, it'll show me on the screen all of the pages where it exists. But if you come down on the page, here are all of the formats that they offer that you can download the title and keep it. It's yours. It's outside of copyright. You have access to it. It gives you the source citation so you know exactly where it came from. It was digitized by the Boston Public Library. It gives you all of the information that you need in order to be able to reference it later. The advantage to downloading the title, and I won't do it here, but the advantage to downloading the title is if you download the PDF, and do a search in the text of the PDF, you get better search results than if you do a search from the screen up here by using the search box within Internet Archives. And I know that seems counterintuitive. You would think that it would do the same thing, but it actually doesn't. Because of the OCR that they use, um, the PDFs are way better. So what I recommend is always downloading the PDF and opening it. You don't have to save it. Just download it and open it and do your search. And if it doesn't have the name you're looking for, then just close the file. But if you do a search on the website, you might actually miss items that you're looking for. But it just, it just has some really cool things in it. You know, it, it, it's just an amazing resource to use regardless of the topic. So if those of you don't already have it bookmarked, I highly recommend that you take the time to go in and bookmark Internet Archive because it's got some really cool stuff. It's one of my favorites. So for those of us who have been doing this for a while, you can't get away from family search. I mentioned it earlier because they offer the research wiki, you know, they offer the courses that you can take online. They do post a blog, not every week. It kind of varies from time to time. It averages about twice a month that they put out their own blog. But they also have what are called family history centers um, that are scattered throughout the state of Illinois. So we have one in Joliet, there's one in Naperville, there's one in Morris. There's one up north by Displains. I'm sure some of you have some that are close by to your libraries as well. And what they have access to is they have access to some of those paid genealogy websites that we can't afford to subscribe to. So they have World Vital Records. They have Newspaper Archive. They have Newspapers.com and Fold3, all of those resources that we would love to have that a lot of us just can't afford based on our library budgets. Um, a lot of them are open to the public multiple days a week, so they have fairly good research hours. They have people who are experts in their particular field, whether you're doing German research or whether you're doing um, Argentinian research or you're looking for records in Pennsylvania. They're going to have somebody there that can help you. Um, and 
you also have access to not only what they've digitized and made available through FamilySearch.org, but they also have their microfilm collection, which is massive. There are over 20 million reels of microfilm that the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City has collected. And if your library is a reciprocal borrower, as mine is, or you have a family history center near you, what you can do is you can request, re request those microfilm reels and have them sent to your library or to the local family history center, and then you have access to view them yourself, whether you're doing research on Italy or whether you're doing research on um, Emporia, Kansas. They're going to have something available to you. Um, but FamilySearch.org is a great resource that you have access to, and again, it's free. With the changes that FamilySearch made to their website last year, um, if some of you haven't been to it in a while or you have not used it before, um, the first thing that you see on, on their screen now when you go to their site is, add your family tree. Didn't used to be that way. You know, a few years ago, their whole model was, we want you to search, 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 search. Well, now they want you to add, add, add. So, you know, there are places where you can, you know, add your family tree, you can add your photos, you can add your, your family information. Um, and that's really why you see that as your first you know, primary thing when you go to their website. But if you go and you're just interested in searching, you can search by any region of the world. So whether you're looking for records in Africa or Asia or in Canada or, or you know, Latin America, you have access to these. But you can also search for specific collections. So you can come down here to collection title and say, I know exactly what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the 1880 US Census. And you can put it in there. Um, or you could tell it, you just want to see everything they have for Illinois, or everything they have for Kansas, or everything they have for Canada. And it's going to pop, pop those records up for you. So Illinois actually has, they say, 64 collections. The number's actually not that high, because that includes all the US censuses and all of those types of things. But they do have some outstanding collections that I want to mention. So they have the Illinois Death and Stillbirth, and I don't know why that didn't come up here, um, which goes from 1916 to 1947. Now the state of Illinois website offers that as well. So if you go to CyberDrive Illinois, you're going to see that in there as well. Um, the difference between CyberDrive Illinois and FamilySearch is that when CyberDrive put together their Deaths and Stillbirths collection, all they included was name, date, and um, certificate number. So you get the county and the certificate number. The people at FamilySearch indexed the entire death certificate. So what that tells you is it shows you every field. So it'll tell you what cemetery they're buried in, who their parents are, who their spouse is. It'll give you a lot of information. So here you kind of see some of the things that they have accessible for Illinois. So the Illinois Deaths and Stillbirths database is an outstanding one. If any of you are like me and have ancestry that came through the city of Chicago, they have the Cook County and Chicago collections for birth, marriages, and deaths, which go up into the 1920s. Um, so if you had your grandparents were married in Chicago or your you know, great uncle was born in Chicago, you have access to those collections as well. So that's specific to Illinois. They've just added a couple of collections for Illinois as well. They added a generic birth and christenings, which you saw a minute ago. And then they have what they just called miscellaneous county records, which has some marriages and some other records kind of thrown in. The state collections are only as good as the people who are indexing. Ancestry has paid professionals. Family Search has volunteers. So some counties, some states, some countries have better records collections available online than others because of the people who are doing um, indexing in those regions. So Ohio has outstanding collections that are in Family Search that have been done. Colorado, not so much. You know, same with New Mexico. Not as many people are indexing those records, or Florida, as are indexing North Carolina or New York. So don't be disappointed if you're not finding what you're looking for in Family Search. You always have access to the microfilm that you can request. There is a fee to have them sent to you. It's really nominal. You know, it's like $6 to have it sent over. Um, so go in and take advantage of their books and their catalogs. So remember when I was talking about digitized books and I talked about Hathi Trust and I talked about Google Books? FamilySearch also has books that they have digitized as well. So. Again, we keep coming up with you know, these same books that we're seeing both in the Hathi Trust, what we find in Internet Archives, 
So there are multiple ways to get at the same title. And what it does is it brings up the PDF for you. Now, can I scroll down? Now you notice the copy in here. It's a fairly good copy. I mean, it's a pretty good image. They scanned in grayscale. They did not scan in color. Um, so it's better than black and white, but it's not as great as what you're going to find on Internet Archives. So take advantage of their books. Take advantage of their card catalogs. You know, go in and, and use those microfilms that they make available to you. Not everything has to be digital, and not everything is going to be available digitally. But if you can point them in the right direction to where they can find it, they're going to love you for it nonetheless. Fold3 I threw in here. Even though Fold3 is a subscription database, Fold3 does offer a lot of free collections that you have access to. Um, some of their World War II collections, their traveling Vietnam wall, wall collection is free. Um, They've got some other collections that are free on their website as well. And then if you sign up on their account to receive their newsletter, about once or twice a year they'll offer free weekends. Usually for Memorial Day and for Veterans Day, they'll offer you know, three or four days of free access. And then you can go in and do all of your searching. Um, so make a list of the things that you want to find and go use it. Um, but what Fold3 is, is it was originally called Footnote, and they were contracted from the National Archives in D.C. to digitize military records. The government built this beautiful $10 million research room for military records that they've never been able to open because the archives just doesn't have the funding. It keeps having their funding cut. We know all about that. So what they did was they contracted with Fold3 to make these records available online, thinking that if they put it online, fewer people would need to come into the library to access the materials. Well, we know that's not the truth, and we know that if you put it online, people are going to come. So the National Archives has seen a dramatic increase in the number of people going to the archives because they found the records on Fold3, and they want to look at the originals. So keep that in mind. If you put your collections online, people are going to come to you because they're going to want to see what you have. They have city directories. They've got newspapers. They have um, vital records for Texas and some New England states. And what they have is what they call Web 2.0 technology. So you can create what they refer to as Facebook pages for the dead, where you can go in and you can create a page for an individual. And you can add your own photo. You can use records out of their collection. Or you can upload your own collection. Um, so they have some really great ways to which you can be interactive. Plus, you can comment and you can tag records that you find in Fold3 as well. So if you see a record and it's misindexed or misspelled, you can make a note right in the record that says that's not actually how this name is spelled. It should be spelled this way. So that way the next person who comes along will be able to see what the correction is. So now here's my question to all of you. It's not really a poll question. It's just something to think about. How many of us are guilty of Googling our own names? I know I am. I am. Um, so Google is a great resource, but it's not the best resource. So us as librarians, we'll use Google quickly if we need a street address or if we need driving directions to get to a particular location. Google can be good for genealogists as long as they know what and how Google is going to work for them. So when I say that, the results are only as good as the information you provide. So what Google does is if I put in Smith family history into Google, what it's going to do is it's going to vomit 8 million results into my lap, and it's going to leave it to me to figure it out. Well, some of us, I'm sure, have seen that study that says that when you're on Google, people will technically, typically only go two pages in before they change their search term. As genealogists, we're tenacious. We might even go 37 pages in. But eventually, we're going to change our search, and we're going to change our search term. Google doesn't ask. Do you mean? So if I'm looking and I put in Smith family tree, it's not going to look for Smith genealogy, Smith family heraldry, Smith ancestry. It's not looking for all of those different terms that you could use to say the same thing. And we know how Google works. You know, if I just put in Smith family tree, it's looking for Smith and family and tree. Or if I put it in quotes, if somebody puts in Smith and Michael's family tree, it's not going to find it. So there are other sites out there that I recommend if you're going to be, quote unquote, Googling your name. And my favorite is Yippee, which is Y-I-P-P-Y.com, or Bing, if any of you have used Bing. I use Bing a lot more than I used to. Um, but what it does is it clusters information. Yippee used to be called Clusty, the clustering engine. Um, and it's an outstanding resource, because what it does is it says, do you mean heraldry? Do you mean ancestry? Do you mean genealogy? And it gives you categories 
of what that would look like. So if I put in Smith Family Genealogy, you see along the line, do we, mean, do we want just photographs? Do we mean family history? And it tells you how many articles are in each one of those categories so you can pursue that further. I love the fact that this does this for me because I think it helps those who are just beginning feel confident that they're getting a good search versus Google where it's so easy to be overwhelmed because it's just throwing thousands and thousands and thousands of resources in your lap and leaving you to sort it out. So I use Yippee a lot. Bing will do the same thing. Yippee does it slightly better. Google is great for several things, though. You have access to Google Books. You have access to Google Maps. And you have access to Google News. Now, have any of you used Google News before? Um, if you haven't, it's something that can be extremely useful to you. But at the same point, it is extremely frustrating. It's like looking at an old microfilm reader. Because you can look at the newspapers, but you can't search them. They're not printable. And they're not indexed by the name of the new, by the location. And I wanted to show you what this looks like. So in your handout, you have access to this bookmark. So it'll take you right to the page. So for me, if I'm doing search locally, there are two Aurora newspapers in here. You know, you've got the Aurora Daily Express, and you've got the Aurora Daily Star. But how many, how many states have Aurora as a city? Or Ottawa is another example. You know, if I go to Ottawa, you know, you have, oh, I went too far, didn't I? No, I didn't. Yeah, I did. I apologize if I'm making any of you nauseous. So if you look at this record, you have the Ottawa Argus, Ottawa Citizen, the Ottawa Daily Citizen, the Ottawa Free, Free Trader, Free Press, Ottawa Times. Which Ottawa? That's what's so mad maddening about Google News, is the fact that you have to click on which one to figure out if it's Ottawa, Illinois, which happens to be the Ottawa Argus, or, or um, yeah, Ottawa Argus, or are we looking at Ottawa in Canada? And in fact, almost all of these except for one is Ottawa, Canada. So it's an outstanding resource if you have ancestors who lived in France or Italy or, or they lived in Canada or Australia because they have international newspapers in here. It's maddening because they only give you the title they don't tell you the location. So there are Illinois papers in here. Um, they're just hard to find because you have to know what the name of the paper is in order to find it. But once you find it and you decide that you want to take a look, it's just like looking at newspaper microfilm. You have to go issue by issue. You have to go page by page. You know, and you have to pan around. There's no printing. There's no saving. There's no searching. So it can be very frustrating. I do a lot of print screens. That's how I get around the fact that you can't print these, is I just do a print screen, I drop it in a Microsoft Office products, and I crop it and save it. Um, but it's frustrating that we can see it, but we can't have it. So Google News has some outstanding things in it. It has the St. Petersburg Times. Because here in Illinois, when people are retiring, a lot of times they're going to Arizona or they're going to Florida. So I can find a lot of information on people who retired to Florida in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. They have the Milwaukee um, Journal Sentinel in here. They have um, Phoenix newspapers. They've got California newspapers in here. So it's not all historic. A lot of it are modern newspapers as well, which are great for finding those obits for you know, the recently deceased. And when I say recently deceased, I mean within the last 20 years which can somehow be hard to find. But it's a great resource, but just keep in mind that it's not a quick fix. It's going to take time to sit and go through issue by issue, page by page, like we saw in that particular issue. You know, you have to just go through as if you were looking at the microfilm and just go page by page, you know, article by article until you find what it is that you're looking for. So it's not, it's not a quick fix solution, but it's definitely an outstanding free resource that you have access to that a lot of people really don't take advantage of very often. So for those of you who have been doing this for a while, hopefully you've been using Google News um, and you've had some success stories. I have had some success stories, um, but it's certainly time consuming. It certainly takes time to have to go through page by page. Speaking of newspapers, 
There are some other outstanding digitized newspaper collections that are accessible to you. Library of Congress is the most well-known with Chronicling America. They do a lot of mid-tier newspapers. They do a lot of, you know, large cities but not huge cities. You know, you're not finding Chicago and New York in there. You're finding, you know, places like Milwaukee, um, Minneapolis, Indianapolis. You're finding those kind of mid-tier sized towns, um, but an outstanding resource. A couple that are relatively new to the scene are The Ancestor Hunt, and you have to put the in. It is The Ancestor Hunt. Um, if you put an Ancestor Hunt, you get a completely different website. Um, they have newspapers. Ella Find is an international free newspaper website um, that I'll show you. And then Fulton History, which I absolutely adore. But um, Tom, the man who runs their website, personally digitized over 12 million newspapers for the state of New York, the entire state, whether you're in Schenectady or whether you're in the Finger Lakes, he digitized them all from the 1820s into the 1990s. Um, the problem is his search is horrible. So the articles that say are 97% wind up not being the ones you want, the ones that say 3% are usually the ones that wind up being what you want. Um, but it's also a free resource, so if you have anybody who comes to you doing New York genealogical research, Fulton History is where you're going to want to send them. So Elephine, like I said, the reason why I hyperlinked this and not the Library of Congress is because Elephine is a one-stop shop resource for me because they've included the Library of Congress newspapers in here. You know, so regardless of what I'm searching, you know, um, see, I have this little box in my way, so I can't see. There we go. Um, So it gives me the list alphabetically by countries, you know, and then it tells me who's the one that actually made them available, you know. So it shows you all of the different Library of Congress was in there, University of Missouri School of Journalism is in here, and then it tells you where you can find it, you know. So then you can go in and, and um, do some additional digging and, and some more granular searching to get you exactly what it is that you want. So it tells me that if I was looking for Lincoln and I specifically just wanted what was accessible from the University of Missouri School, I can do that and it's going to take me directly to, directly to the pages and it's going to make it accessible to me that I can download, I can print it, you know. So it's got some good resources in it. I really like Elephine because I do a lot of research in New Zealand and in Australia um, because of a project that I've been working on. And they have like the Auckland New Zealand papers in there so then I can do my searching. As genealogists, for those of us who have been doing it for a while, we know that information is not going to be in just one place. Siblings move around, parents move around, children move around. So I actually found an obit in the Auckland New Zealand newspaper for John Folds of Lyons, Minnesota because his brother was living in Auckland at the time, and that obit, which isn't digitized online because the Lions papers aren't accessible, I found that obit in Auckland, New Zealand, because that's where his brother was living at the time. So, you know, even if something isn't available online where you think it should be, there's always ways to get around that. The Associated Press has been around since the Civil War, since before the Civil War. So sometimes when you think something's not newsworthy enough to have been picked up by the AP, sometimes you get lucky. To give you an example, there was a suicide in Plainfield in 1907. Ada Smith was a young girl. She was despondent because her fiancé had broken their engagement, and she drowned herself in the horse trough of the family farm. That got picked up by the AP and ran in Oklahoma and in California and in um, Atlanta. I mean, it ran all across the country. So, you know, the suicide of a young girl in a town of the population of 700 got picked up by the AP and was run all the way around, you know, the U.S. So, you know, just because a paper isn't online for the year you're looking for in your city, it's very possible it could have been picked up and run somewhere else. So these digitized newspaper collections are outstanding because you can search by name and you can do a search without having to choose a location. So they're a great resource for you and they're great to pass on your patrons because you have access to them for free. So in your handout, I gave you many more than just what would fit on this slide here. But you have access to those as well. So now specifically for Illinois, for those of us who either have our collections up online or 
are encouraging patrons who are doing Illinois research. Um, the Carly Digital Collections are outstanding if you haven't had the opportunity to use some of these. The Illinois State, um, Illinois Digital Archives, Ida, Illinois, which is available through the State of Illinois Library, um, has some good collections too. And I'm going to just touch on these briefly to kind of give you an idea of what's accessible. So what I was just saying about things not always being where you think they should be and not being accessible in places where you think they, they would be accessible. In Will County, um, the township of Moni, their tax assessor books are somehow owned by Governor State University, which isn't even, you know, part of Will County. So, and they digitize them. So I can go in and I can look at the tax assessor records for Moni Township because they've been made available through the Carly Collections from Governor State University. So they have some really outstanding things that are accessible to you um, that are definitely genealogical in nature. Things like tax records which show you properties. They've got all kinds of maps. I love this one. Did you see that sing a song of gangsters? Fun. Growing up on the south side in Bridgeport, I'm curious to know what it is they say about uh, about Bridgeport down here. Um, oh, see, there's the stockyard. So yeah, so my family lives eh, pretty much right about over here, you know, where all the bombs are going off. Wonderful, right? Um, so there's some really cool things in here that you have access through by using Carly. So university collections are great resources of local history. Local history, genealogy work hand in hand. Genealogy just means that you're looking for a particular set of surnames. Genealogy and local history are, are tied because local history are things that include yearbooks, phone books, city directories, maps, property records. All of those things are going to have individual names on them, but they're not an individual family, which makes them local history versus genealogy. So going in and using a university archives or special collections to learn more about the community is going to have genealogy inherently built into it. So it's going to have photos of, you know, VFW picnics and Grand Army of the Republic reunions, and they're going to have photos of high school classes and grade school classes which may or may not have the individuals named, but it's going to offer that genealogical resource that you're not necessarily going to be able to find um, online without using some of these collections. Like St. Xavier University has their newspaper collections online. I think um, the vedette for ISU is online as well. So if you had an ancestor that went to ISU, they could very easily show up in the vedette because they were listed as taking part in a dance, or they were on the debate club, or they were at the football rally and their picture was taken. So, you know, there's a lot of ways in which what you find in university collections can be really important to the genealogy research that you're doing. So, don't rule out archives, don't rule out um, colleges and universities, their special collections, because they could very easily have what you're looking for. So use the Carly collections and go in and play around a little bit because they've got some really unique and some really neat things accessible to you. University of Illinois Digital Collections has a really good map collection as well that has some great Illinois state maps, state, full state maps, um, which can be important if you had a town name change or a town that died because the railroad closed. Um, using these old maps through University of Illinois can be really beneficial. So the Illinois Digital Archives, we uploaded our collections to Ida, Illinois in 2009, so you'll see the Plainfield Public Library collection in there. We did Will County records, we did photos, we did newspapers. Um, there are other, um, the Naperville Public Library has all of their 20s, 30s, and 40s phone books digitized and accessible in here. So they have a really wide range of things. Um, the old digital past, um, which used to be the old CCS collection, um, local history collection, got absorbed in Ida, Illinois. So they have a postcard collection for the entire state of Illinois. So they even have Plainfield in there. Um, so they have some really cool things that are done by us, by us as individual libraries, by us working with historical societies and other organizations. Um, like we saw with Carly, you can look at items in different sizes. They're fully searchable. I am not wild about the new platform. I don't want to look at Ida as I look at Facebook. I want to be able to search collections. So 
this kind of bugs me a little. It might not bother the rest of you. Um, but up in the upper right-hand corner, you see that search box. That's where you can put in exactly what you're looking for. Or you can just browse all collections. I grew up in Lombard. I used to sit. If you look at the entrance to this bank, there's little ledges. They're like triangles that stick out from the corner of the stairs. We used to sit on those when I was in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So when I found this picture, I started laughing because I remember as a kid hopping up and sitting on those watching the traffic go by. I was so nostalgic for it, I decided I wanted to download it. So up in the upper right-hand corner, you can download, and it asks you, what size? Do you want large? Do you want medium? Or do you want small? What are you going to use it for? Are you putting it in a presentation so you don't need the large? Or do you want to blow it up and put it on your wall? So it gives you the option to download in a variety of different sizes. Have any of you used Ida, Illinois? Or I guess a better question is, do any of you have collections posted in Ida, Illinois. You can go ahead and type those into the questions box at any time if you do. I know a lot of libraries participate. So it tells me when I look up Lombard that there are 929 results. What I love about Ida, Illinois is that there's metadata. You do a Google search, you're out on Flickr, and you're looking for images. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of metadata. It doesn't tell you where it came from. It doesn't tell you how old it is. It doesn't give you where I can locate the original. What I love about Ida, Illinois is that when this goes live, it's already in WorldCat, when this goes live into DPLA, it's going to have all of that metadata associated with it so that people are going to be able to go in and use that um, to find the original. If I was looking at a transcript of a book, it would be translated below it. So if I was looking at a page and I was trying to read old handwriting and I was having a hard time with it, it would show me the image at the top and then it would show me at the bottom the actual text. Um, and it gives us all the details. It tells us where it came from, it tells us who put it on, it gives us the rights. So it tells us that you know it's owned by the Lake County Discovery Museum. And it, it gives all the information that we need as librarians to be able to cite our source. So it has some outstanding things that we can use it. So take advantage of what's available in Ida, Illinois. These are our collections. These are the things that we're proud of. These are the things that we wanted to make accessible to the public. It's not always things within our community. So what I have for Plainfield is Will County wide. It's not just for Plainfield. And a lot of these communities are the same way. So as you can see, you know, all of the different institutes, you know, Art Institute, all the different institutions and libraries that take part in here. Um, hospitals, nursing, businesses, railroads. There's a lot of things in here for us to take advantage of. So use Ida, Illinois. It doesn't get used anywhere near as often as it should. It is probably one of the best local history resources that you are going to find for the state of Illinois. So I'm going to kind of rush through, so to speak, these last few slides because they're just giving you ideas of places to look for information. So now, Illinois County records, there are some counties that have made their records accessible online with online databases where you can search for a name and then if you choose to purchase the birth record or death record or property record, you can then do so straight through the website and it brings up the link for the original image. Cook County was the first to do it, they're the most well known. Um, David Orr's office um, put together their collection probably about six years ago, which is why the digital images were removed from FamilySearch and you were left with the indexes because they had put together their own online collection. I will tell you that Cook County genealogy is woefully missing thousands and thousands of vital records. It is not complete. It's missing most of the marriages from the 1930s and the 1940s, and it's missing a huge swath of birth records um, up until 1915. So if you've gone to Cook County genealogy and you're disappointed because you can't find mom and dad's marriage certificate, my parents' marriage certificate isn't in there, and I have a copy of it. So I know it's registered in Cook County. It's just when they put this database together, there were lots of records that were missed. So don't assume it's not there, um, but take advantage of the website. DeKalb has one. Kane County has one as well. Kane County goes all the way into the 1990s. So if you had a birth marriage or a death that happened in Aurora or St. Charles or Kane County in general, you have access. Um, Macopin County somehow disappeared. So it was online. It was accessible to find. Now all of a sudden it's not there anymore. So I don't know if they're having problems with their site 
or if they had a problem with the contract, but at the moment, it's missing. But the rest of these are there. Bureau of County is there as well. If any of you know of any others, please send me an email and let me know. I'm happy to add them so we can keep a list of resources. And then for those of you who are doing specifically Chicagoland research, a look at Cook is a, these are all alphabetical. They're not in order of my favorite. Um, a look at Cook has some good resources that a lot of people have a tendency to overlook. Um, Chicago Ancestors is the website that was put together by the Newberry Library, and I'll bring that up in a second. Chicago Genealogical Society has a collection in it of early Chicago newspapers. Now, you can search that database without having a subscription to the Chicago Genealogical Society, and these are from the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s, so they're referencing marriages that took place in Lake County and in Plainfield and in Kankakee because they didn't have papers yet. So you'll find a lot of references to marriages and deaths and movements of people in the collar counties. So use it, by all means. If you have ancestors in the mid-1800s in Illinois, in northern Illinois, use that resource to see if they pop up in any of those newspapers. They're just an index. You're not going to see the original image, but it's worth your time. Leslie at the Chicago History Museum has some outstanding collections. They have newspapers. They have um, their neighborhood collection of photographs. They've got some really good things available to you. Um, they've got the 1928 Chicago City Directory digitized and available through their site. Um, Chicago Public Library has several collections, including a couple digitized newspaper collections available online through their local history collection. And then the National Archives Great Lakes region has some really outstanding records. National Archives has federal records, but believe it or not, bankruptcies are federal records. So if you have an ancestor who was bankrupted because of the Civil War in the 1870s or were bankrupted during the Great Depression, odds are they might have those records at the National Archives on Pulaski. They also have city directories, they have censuses, they have a whole bunch of other genealogical type records. They have military records. They have Great Lakes Naval Base. They have Fort Sheridan. They've got some really cool things within their collection as well. Um, but I want to show you briefly Chicago ancestors. Matt Rutherford, who is the head of genealogy at the Newberry Library, is a fantastic guy. And they worked for years to get this collection put together. And it's based on a Google map. So you can see every Catholic church in the city of Chicago, whether it's still open or whether it's been closed. And you can search it by address. So let's put in. So if I put in State Street, it shows me some cool things. It shows me all the people who died or who were murdered on near State Street. It shows me that they've added digitized books. It tells me who some of the earliest families were. Um, it shows me how that shows up in their maps collection. And then it gives me their church records. So what it tells me is All Saints is the closest church. What it tells me is, is it open? Has it closed? If it's closed, where are the records available now? And the types of records that exist. So it tells me that I can get a family history film sent to me. There's the number. And it tells me that they have the marriages and deaths from 1890 to 1915. They also have them on their website. FamilySearch.org has the Chicago Catholic Church parish records up to 1915 for every church, Catholic church. Um, but it's page by page. Um, the, it's better to do page by page. The index isn't. Um, isn't that great, especially for the Polish churches. But they've got some great things that they've been adding to this platform. You know, so it tells me that you know, church closed in 1994, but they have the yearbooks at the Chicago History Museum, and they're accessible to me if I go there. So they did an outstanding job of putting this all together. I want to see the homicide just because I'm slightly twisted that way. You know, and then it tells me that near the railroad tracks there was a homicide. You know, it gives me the name of the victim and then tells me that if I go to the homicide database, which is sponsored by Northwestern University, I can find out slightly more details. So there's some cool things in here, but their tools are what are really impressive. So they have access to city directories. They have access to what is most important to anybody who's doing Cook County and Chicago research is that the city renamed and renumbered its streets. So they changed the street names in 1912, but they also renumbered the city streets on two different occasions. So Pulaski 
which was originally called Crawford, you will see pop up under the street name changes. I grew up on Normal. Um, normal used to be Butler. So if I'm looking for Normal on the south side, you know, before 1912, I need to be looking under Belt Butler. Or Fifth Street became Wells. So anytime you're looking for anything pre-1912, you want to use one of these two references to get you on the right track and make sure that you let your patrons know all cities renumber and rename. City of Joliet renumbered in the 1930s, City of Aurora renumbered, City of Danville renamed and renumbered. So this isn't a big city phenomenon. I'm sure some of you have had your street names and street addresses renumbered at one time. Plainfield just did their renumbering seven years ago. So it's still going on. So you know, keep that in mind when you're using city directories or references like this, that um, the address that you might know it to be today might not be the address that it was originally. So cemetery websites, I mentioned Find a Grave earlier. They were bought out by Ancestry.com. So you'll see it there as well as in World Vital Records. Billion Graves also is partnered with FamilySearch.org, so you'll find it in both places. Um, Billion Graves is great because it uses GPS coordinates. The downside to it is you can walk a cemetery and upload a whole cemetery worth of photos, but then somebody has to go back and put the names in. Find a grave, you have to do both at the same time. So if you upload an image, you have to put the name in yourself, which is great because Billion Graves will just bring up 100 photos in a cemetery and you have to go through each one because none of them are named. So they both have useful information in them. They're both free and accessible online. Um, they're both run by volunteers, so again, it's only as good as the inf information provided. Um, sometimes the photos aren't great. Sometimes you'll have a date of death on a headstone, but they don't put any additional information in. They don't put date of birth, they don't put spouse, they don't put any of that in. So sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's frustrating, but they're all free. Immigration websites are things that you get asked about a lot as well. Um, Castle Garden, um, New York City, pre-1840, or actually 1848 to roughly 1892 when Ellis Island opens. Somebody will correct me, I'm sure, on the exact dates. Um, Ellis Island, 1892. Um, if you're looking for information on the Port of New York in between that time, Ancestry has those collections available online. But you can also find free records at Immigrant Ships Transcribers Guild. Brigham Young University has collections out there. But then Stephen Morris. I absolutely love Stephen Morris. And if any of you have not heard of him, the man is a genius. I mean, a certified genius. His job, his goal in life is to build a better mousetrap. So what he has figured out how to do is to build better searching than the search site itself. So he's figured out how to build a better search strategy than Ellis Island. He's figured out how to build a better search strategy than Ancestry or Family Search or any of the other websites out there. And he puts them available on his website so that you have access to his one-step searching. So for example, you'll see ones that have little dollar signs. Those are ones because they're paid access. So for the Ancestry Library Edition ones, you'll see dollar signs because they take you to a, a paid site. But for all the other ones, you can go ahead and do your searching, and it's not going to cost you anything. So I recommend that you do this, that you go to Ellis Island and you do a search on a name. Make up a name, whether it's your family name or somebody else's name, and then go into his stevemorris.com or stevemorris.org and do the same search on that same name and see how the results come out. Because he really did do an amazing job. But what he also made available, which is even more outstanding for geeks like me who really like the original, is he made the original microfilms available. So you can go through the entire microfilm by choosing it out of his list and view it page by page by page. And why this is important is because people who were sent back or people who died on board are usually mentioned either at the very beginning of the book or at the very end of the book. So if you're looking to find out who was returned or who died on board, you know, if you go to, to Ellis Island, it just takes you to the page of the manifest. It doesn't show you the beginning or the end, whereas in his site you have access to that. So it could be really useful to find out, I know they came to the States, but some for some reason they were sent back, you can find this information through Stephen Morse's site. So he's got some really cool stuff available to you. And he tells you there are different types of forms based on the different types of searching that you're doing. So it has some cool stuff. Oh no. 
um, you can go in and, and play around with it. Um, but it has some really, really neat stuff that he's made accessible. I mean, he, he's really a brilliant, brilliant man. So we have time for questions. Louise wanted me to make sure that I ended early enough so that all of you could ask specific questions if you had them. Louise will also make the webinar available after this, as well as the PowerPoint presentation. So if those of you were furiously taking notes, I apologize. Um, but she will make the PowerPoint accessible to you as well, and my contact information is on there. Um, you can always email me or call me anytime you like. I'm at the Plainfield Public Library. My email address is T for Tina. Last name is Beard, B as in boy, E-A-I-R-D. I have extra vowels in my name at plainfieldpubliclibrary.org. So I'm happy to take questions, and thank you all. I appreciate you, you attending today. Thanks so much, Tina. Um, we do have a few more minutes, so if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type those into the question box, and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, we haven't had any questions come in yet, so um, I'm sure everyone's just sitting there thinking about all this great information we just heard. So um, go ahead and share those questions at any point. Um, one person wanted to share that they have a family history center in Rockford, Illinois, and I'm sure there's many others in Illinois. Do they have a list of centers on their website? They do. If, yeah. if you go into um, their wiki page, it'll list all of the family history libraries, not just in Illinois, but mm -hmm. all over the world. Um, Rockford has an outstanding, if, do I have the Rockford Public Library? They have an outstanding local history page on their website. Bravo. I just used it a couple days ago. It is, it's top notch. It's well done. All right. Well, we're waiting for questions to come in. I'll ask you a couple questions and put you on the spot. Oh, so answer all our, our poll questions. Oh, we've got one. Well, one of them we didn't really do as a poll. Um, uh, Tina shared a lot of different websites. Um, but if you have a favorite genealogy website, if you want to go ahead and put those into the chat box, I'll share those with the audience in just a moment. And then we do have one more poll that I'll do in a couple minutes. But um, so my question for you, Tina, is when somebody comes up to you at the reference desk and says, I want to research my family tree, what are the first three things that you have them do? You know, if they, they let's say they're new to genealogy, they've never started, and what, what do you tell them? I teach a lot of genealogy classes around the state and nationally, actually. And the first class I teach in my series is called Unlocking the Secrets to Your Family Tree. And what I have you do is I have you assess what you already have. So the first thing I would tell somebody who's just starting out is, what do you have? What do you know? What documents do you have? Do you have a birth certificate, a mass card? Do you have a baptismal certificate, a wedding announcement? What do you have? What you need to do is you need to go through your house. We have stuff in every room, stuff in the basement, stuff in your office, stuff on the kitchen counter. You know, that wedding invitation for your cousin's wedding last year, where is that? Take all of that stuff and put it in one location. Because you can't start searching until you know what it is that you're searching for. You can't do a search for somebody if you, you don't know um, what you have. So the first thing you could do is, is get everything put together and make a list. OK, I have mom's marriage certificate, but not her birth certificate. OK, I have grandpa's birth certificate, but not his death certificate. And then from there, you know what you're looking for. All right, if I'm going to start searching online, I'm going to go and I'm going to look for these things that I'm missing. So once you know what you're missing and what you need, then you can start going online and looking for them. So yes, most people start with Ancestry. Most people start with Family Search. Those are great places to start. But what I would also take advantage of on those sites are the charts and the forms because you need something to work with. You need something organized so you can keep track of what you've found. So I usually print off forms or have forms available to somebody who's just starting out, but they need to know what they have. They need to know what they're missing. Once they know what they're missing, then yes, then I can give them dedicated websites. OK, you're looking for Irish. You're going to go here. OK, you're looking for South Carolina. You're going to go here. And I can give them targeted locations on where to start. Because if you don't know what you're missing, you're going to get frustrated very easily. You know, or you'll find something and you'll be like, oh, I'm so excited, look what I found, but you already had it sitting on the table and you didn't go through what you had first. So those are the three things I recommend doing first. Okay, awesome. So I did get two more questions in. Um, how do you find immigration records for people who arrived by plane and not by ship? It depends on the time period. If we're talking planes, we're talking most likely after 1936. Um, they can be hard, but you have to go through the National Archives. And if you go to archives.gov, They've got a, a place on their website where you can request 
records. The problem is, if they didn't naturalize, then there's a hard way to track them. But if they did naturalize, then the National Archives is the place to start, or the location where they naturalized. Like in the city of Chicago, um, Phil Costello's office, uh, Dorothea Brown's office, the Circuit Court Archives, has a naturalization index that's available. It's online. It's for free. Um, so it'll give you when they entered, where they entered, the name of the ship, or whatever it was that they were on, along with their naturalization information. So if they're coming to the states and they're by plane, if they did not naturalize, then it's really hard to track them. Uh, but if they did naturalize, then that information would be on their certificate. Um, are you aware of any um, newspaper sites, digital newspaper sites, that would work with a library to digitize old newspapers at a low cost? There's several, actually. Ancestry will do it, but I don't recommend it because um, there's, there's lots of issues about you retaining the rights to your own stuff when you go through Ancestry. Um, Ida, Illinois is always looking for things that they can digitize and upload, so they'd be a great resource. Um, World Vital Records digitizes small collections, um, and they do an outstanding job of making things accessible. Um, those would probably be the two that I would start with first. Ida, Illinois would give you wider, I guess, a, a wider market once it goes into DPLA, because then you have um, more people looking at it. Um, someplace like Champaign, um, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, which is digitizing newspapers, they might be interested in doing it. Um, so there's a variety of places out there. Um, but if you send me an email, I can put together a list for you and, and give you some suggestions. All right, and that's the end of the questions, but I did have one person typed in a favorite genealogy website, and that's yeah, US GenWeb for county resources. US GenWeb is great. It was down the last couple of days. They had, I don't know if they were hacked or if they had a server go down, but half of their collection was um, out for the count. Um, but US GenWeb is great. It's run by volunteers. Um, the Illinois State Genealogical Society had their website in there originally. Um, the Will County Genealogical Society's information is put in US GenWeb. It's a great resource. The downside to US GenWeb is that a lot of smaller societies don't update their collections often enough. So you'll go to US GenWeb and it'll say last updated 2002. Um, but that doesn't mean that the information that's provided isn't useful. It just means that there could be much more. So if you use something out of US GenWeb, you should always contact the society to see what else they've collected since then. Well, I went ahead and launched the last poll question about whether or not this webinar has given you a little more confidence to help genealogy patrons. And so far, everybody has said yes. So <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, so thank you so much, Tina. I'm going to um, go ahead and close the poll and, and share that. There you go. So, all right. Well, thank you uh, again to Tina for joining us today and sharing her expertise in genealogy research. And um, as she said, uh, thank you uh, to Tina for letting us record and um, share this information with you later. We'll get that up on the Rails website as soon as possible. So thanks again, Tina, and thank you all for joining us. And we'll go ahead and end the webinar. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.